control is. Even if it's not the most important software, it's, it's pretty interesting. And if you are in the process of building a BSP or moving a BSP to another platform, you're going to really want to know what goes on here. Because if you're new to the world of BSP, if you're new to the world of device development, you, uh, you may not know that you don't have a lot, of, a, a lot of the same kind of support that you get as an application developer. You don't have a debugger to help you out. I mean, I'll show you the line of code where the debugger is, st is started. It's way down after thousands of instructions have executed. So you have to figure out another way to, 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 to address the problem. And typically, we use printf to use a uh, standard, standard approach. So my talk today is three parts. I'm going to talk about how it is that I came to look at the startup code. Uh, my suspicion is that there's a lot of you who, like me, um, as soon as Microsoft created the shared source program, you probably quickly dug down into the private directory and you wandered around and you found all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, there's thousands of lines of code there, billions of files, all kinds of hierarchy in the, in the file system. Um, so it's, it's kind of a confusing place to even wander, but you probably did. I know I did. I know I looked at the startup code a long time ago. But I came back to take a second look because I was involved with a, a project that was porting a BSP, CE6, and that's uh, Project Drumsticks, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. The uh, second part of my talk, you know, if you decide that startup is really important to you, then you're probably going to do what I did, and you start searching the code. You start thinking, well, what, what's the name of this function? It's probably going to be start or start up. <laughs> but maybe it's init something. And so you go through these pure permutations, you do these searches, and you have to, of course you have to search the entire directory tree because public common oak has some interesting things, but private has some interesting things, and platform has some interesting things. So if you really want to do a thorough search, you have to start at kind of the, the CE600 right there and just search the whole darn tree. Uh, and you, you do your search, you go away, you come back an hour later, and oh, wrong thing to search for. <laughs> so my goal today is not, to, not that all of you understand every single line of code, but so that you understand the two or three or four places that you can trip and get lost, so that when you go back and you have to do the same sort of thing, it's, it's pretty easy to do. Because now that I've been through it, looking back, that wasn't that hard. It's not that complicated. But nothing is once you understand it, right? It's only kind of when you first going into it. At the very end of my talk, I will go through the boot time call stack. I'll do it a couple of times. Uh, once very cursorily, once graphically, and then once in the actual code. Just so you get a, a feel for all the fun stuff there is there. So Project Drumsticks, what is this? Well, before I go too much further, I should acknowledge David Vescovi, who's in the audience. David, can you stand up? I didn't know I was being embarrassed with this. You probably suspect it. So um, David was involved with, um, with Project Drumsticks, even before we called it Project Drumsticks. Um, what I have in my hand is a, a Gumsticks um, single board computer. Uh, there's a, a photograph of it on the slide next to a real stick of gum. You'll see that's a little longer than a real stick of gum. And it says you won't want, you want accidentally start chewing on it as well. Um, but we, um, in, in, in Redmond, we have an organization called the Windows Embedded Developers Interest Group, where we did. We meet on Redmond, on Microsoft campus, uh, first Wednesday of the month. We've been doing that for the past two or three years. Um, and we, um, actually about two years ago, we were getting ready to come to MEDC, and we asked our members if there was any, any talks that anyone wanted to do at, at future we did meetings. And this guy who came up to me, he works at Microsoft, not Microsoft uh, Embedded Group, but he came up and he said, you know, I have this idea for a project. But it's going to take me a little while to do it. But after I do it, I think I'll have a talk. Said, OK, great. What is it? Well, there's this computer that runs Linux, see? And I want to port Windows CE to it. I said, OK, cool, ambitious. I thought, OK, we'll be scheduling his talk in about five years from now. He's still working on it. I said, you know what? This guy's named Nate Wadu. I said, Nate, maybe we could do this as a group project. Would that be OK? He said, that's a great idea. So Nate came up with the idea. I thought, well, let's make this kind of a weeding project. So we posted it all over our, our, our bulletin board, all, all over our forum. And then we promptly forgot about it. And then David called us up and says, you know, I've been doing that for the past year. I've been working on porting this, in, in those days it was CE5, to this guy's fixed computer. So we hooked up with David. Um, we, we're doing a little bit more of it on the CE6 side. Actually, David said he's doing some CE6 as well. Um, but the idea is we're taking this poor little computer. This is actually the, the development boards, the two development boards sandwiched around the actual uh, single board computer. Um, this poor little computer was born and sent into the world without an operating system. OK, I'm being cruel. It, it was sent out in the world with, with a, a GPL operating system, a Linux with a, the U-boot and a boot loader. We thought that was a terrible thing to do to a system. So we put, we put CE5 and now CE6 on it. Uh, for those of you who want 
more information on drumsticks. Uh, the URL is there. For those of you who want uh, more information about our, our, our BSPs, um, actually, since this slide was made, uh, bat.net is actually going away. So we're actually consolidating on the code flex side. Um, but uh, this is where I get my, my experience from. And one of the things that, I, that we quickly learned as we were rewriting the we were rewriting uh, various other elements, is that this becomes really important and valuable to you. So those of you who've never looked at a BSP before and don't know what this is, you will soon, soon know and love this well. Um, of course, this is the output that's get, that gets spewed as, as the system comes up. Um, and this is important because if you take a platform and you break it somehow, I mentioned you, you don't have the, the debugger help to figure out where things went wrong. So this was, of course, real useful to you to find that out. Just, uh, two, two PowerPoint slides does not at all begin to suggest how much you actually get. There's all sorts of, of, of book. Now what I'm going to do, just to give you a better idea of what's involved, I'm going to boot my uh, thumbsticks for you. Now, um, previously, when I was thinking about getting ready for this talk, I thought, you know, I shouldn't have it all set up, just push a button and go. But who believes that that's how things are really done? Yeah, because it's been my experience that one of the hardest things in the world to do is to connect a uh, embedded hardware to a development platform. So I'm just going to walk through real quickly what I'm doing as I do it. And that is, of course, there's a power cord, which we hook up. And I'm going to actually switch over to this system, which has, uh, which has a platform builder, Visual Studio with a platform builder plug-in. And I'm actually not going to plug my power cord in yet, because that's going to cause the boot process to take place. Uh, Gumsticks gives you this wild um, serial connector, which is actually like a, a mouse or keyboard connector. Very strange. It means you have to buy that, that $12 part from them. Ooh, boy, I make a lot of money on showing that. And now I'm actually going to plug in an active sync cable, a cable with a USB cable with a, a mini USB on the other side. Now I mentioned active sync. Some of you probably want to, well, why would you want to do active sync? Where are you going? This poor system has been through so much trauma in its life, subjected to, uh, to Linux. Why are you going to now add insult to injury <laughs> with active system? Well, you'll see why. The Society for Prevention of Cruelty to, uh, to motherboards. Yeah. Um, and then I have, uh, I want to hook up to the network, and what I actually do is I use a crossover cable, because you know, I don't need any stinking DHCP, I don't need any uh, hubs. But that means I have a static, and I need a static IP address on both sides. And now on this side of things, I'm going to start up my hyper terminal. And what this, what this means is I need to make a quick change here. Tell us what I want to get using the com file. I actually don't have a serial port on my laptop, which is not odd because serial ports are legacy in the world of Microsoft laptops. So I had a USB to serial connector, which somehow is working fine. Nice so I put the power supply in, and lo and behold, I hope something happens. Ah, here we go. Uh, starting auto download, it says. So I'm going to reset here real quick. So I wake up and says, aha, I'm going to see bootloader common library version 1.4. Press space to cancel. Now, Gumsticks came with a uh, open source bootloader. Um, David, you put on a different bootloader, right? Which I think we called WeBoot. So this is WeDig, WeBoot. Uh, Lee Leahy is in, is in the process of creating another one. We call that WeBoot. Uh, so if you want to be famous, write your own bootloader. And just name it after yourself. Um, so this is no GPL code. This is our little bootloader. And um, I'm going to turn off DHCP because I, I need it. I'm going to stink in DHCP. <coughs> Hopefully, didn't add, uh, there we go. That, that's correct. And now I can say I want it to go. And it does the usual thing that you'd expect for a CE bootloader. It does a broadcast of boot me. So I must have a platform builder around here. And I'll just do a patch. Why did, why did you do so many green windows to top? That's so crazy. Now, why do we have active sync? 
I'm going to start acting soon. Because I have this thing called the virtual display app, which is going to allow us to see the output um, from a virtual display driver, which writes into a, um, a memory window, essentially like a video. Device. Of course, there's no video device on this. But, and then we're going to actually pump it over the USB line and see it on the display, or see it on the display. So our download is, is complete, and now we're getting lots of great messages. So there's something going on, activity, debug messages, streaming at us, all good stuff. And now at some point, uh, ActiveSync just made us happy noise, and there we go. And now Microsoft wants to know if I want a partnership with them. <laughs> Not today, but thank you. Sorry? Uh, yes, at, at this point, I believe, you no, know, if I were hooked up over, over DHCP, I could, I could cancel it. Uh, oh, oh, could I cancel that one? Uh, I don't know. Um, I know hooked over, up over DHCP, I can actually get rid of active sync. And once the connection is made, everything goes into the wire. But when I'm hooked up this way, um, I need active sync here, otherwise it, it all dies. So there we go, look at this fabulous little CD6 device. Running here. Lots of fun. In the process of getting here, we ran into a few snags, and so I was tasked to go off and figure out, uh, take the boot process, dissect it, and help the rest of the group understand what, what all the heck was going on. And the result is here. So when I got started, I knew I needed to figure out how this how the OS started up, and so I needed some initial entry point. And um, when I didn't find it, there's some interesting things you should know about this. Um, I, I sort of thought the G8 will be like to start up, and that's all it does. But you look at it more, and you read the comments, and you go, wait a minute. Startup is called not only for, uh, for when you initially turn the power on, but it's also called for a warm reset, or it's also called for a watchdog timer. And by the way, this, this code also may be called by the bootloader. It might be shared by the bootloader, which it executes it, then calls into the bootloader code, which downloads your image from, in this case, Ethernet, like I demonstrated, or, or over serial, or over wherever, JTAG, for heaven's sake. And then that code gets executed again as part of nk.bin at address zero when it goes and resets. So, so whatever it does, you have to make sure that if you do it twice, it doesn't hose you, right? So that's, that's an important thing. Uh, and what's the environment? Well, the, um, the key thing, I, I think, from the execution, from what I call my initial, initial execution point, the key thing is you, you realize that there's a whole lot of stuff that sometime will eventually be running, but at the moment you need it, it isn't there. So you, there's no global variables, there's no debugger. Uh, there's the memory management unit might be running and it might not be running. Um, all those wonderful caches and translation look aside buffers and everything that's done to make this be performant, um, they're there, but they're in some weird unknown state. You have no idea what you're doing, so you turn them all off. Interrupts might even be occurring. You turn the interrupts off. So it, it, in general, actually, it's a pretty easy piece of code to understand once you sort of realize that that you've got this potentially massively chaotic situation, you just turn everything off and just pass control onto the OS, uh, the OS loader code. Um, this is this is a BSP specific piece of code. So most of the code that we looked at is actually part of the Microsoft initialization code. But they leave this tiny little tail, this tiny little piece uh, that we're supposed to implement. It's supposed to be part of the BSP. In directory terms, this tiny part is in the platform directory. Everything else is pretty much in the private directory. So here's a map of uh, some of the first functions I looked, looked for or looked at when I was searching for startup. Uh, some of these actually occur more than one time. So kernel start occurs twice, which is like, OK, that's fine, but confusing. OAL startup, there's actually a good reason why OAL startup is twice, as you will see. It's because um, the debug function, the uh, startup code um, gets linked to both of them. And the startup, startup function actually calls both OAL startups depending on how you're building and how you're linking. So these are some of the functions I looked, up, looked at and I found, found these as well. Turns out that just about every single one of these functions plays some role in the startup process. 
So it's good to know about these, but of course the critical one we care about is that one. And just for fun, I'm just gonna make a list of where they are, but if you know the name, you can find it pretty quickly, so that's kind of silly. Uh, what I do have here is um, another way to look at the startup process. And it's from the perspective of the staircase, or an evolution, if you will, that um, coming in from the left, the first thing that we worry about is just getting the CPU stable. That's what the BSP is supposed to do. It then passes control to this function kernel start. Um, and kernel start, if you look at the sequence, it's kind of, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Kernel start puts the page tables in a known state, then turns on the memory management unit. That does make sense, right? Now, now we have uh, virtual memory. Now we can address things uh, with 32 bit virtual address. Prior to this, we couldn't. So prior to this, we didn't, global variables didn't make sense. Prior to this, um, touching anything outside of just our instruction stream didn't make sense. After we do that, we can enable the, the interrupt vectors, and that's what NK startup does for us. Incidentally, the jump from kernel start to NK startup is a, is a really weird one. And it's weird because no place, if you it's pretty easy to follow code, generally speaking, right? Function A calls fun, fun, you know, sequence, 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 oh, function call, find that function, okay. So sequence, 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 okay, return. Pretty straightforward. The, the jump from kernel start to NK startup is not like that at all. And I'll walk you through what we do. Essentially, it, it, it goes to the file system, goes to the ROM file system, looks for this thing called kernel.dll in the, in the ROM file system, finds its entry point, and just jumps into that memory address. And there, there actually is a comment that suggests that. And until you kind of look through, you kind of go, wait, how do we get here? And how do we really know that this is where we need to be? Well, NK startup is, is, is sort of the first of two jumps that uh, took a lot of, a lot of uh, sweat, uh, sweat equity on my part. Once the interrupt vectors are in place, uh, the next thing to do is, you know, config.bib might say, gee, we have this much RAM, but a given system might have, uh, config.bib might say 32 meg, we might have another 32 meg. So uh, kernel find memory runs out and finds if we have that, or it sees if we have multiple execute in place regions that might be there that the uh, OEM has told us about. And once we've done that, once we know all the RAM we have, the next thing is we can construct our object store. Because the object store lives in RAM, right? And we also know where our program memory is. It's halfway along there. Incidentally, prior to there being an object store, there was another file system. And of course, it is the ROM file system. And, and we'll look at that when we look at the code. So once we have our, our memory, once we have our memory in place, once we have our interrupts in place, once we have um, our object store in place, our file system in place, now we can really start up the kernel process. Now we can start up nk.exe. Now the jump from starting up nk.exe to this next function, the system startup function, is another weird one. The jump to nk startup was weird. The jump to system startup uh, function is the second weird one. That is the first scheduled thread in the OS. Prior to that running, there are no other threads except the single startup thread that's executing everything. Uh, there really isn't even a process except until MK comes along. Uh, but with system startup func, um, there's a jump that's made to what's called the first address. That really kind of kickstarts the scheduler. And the initialization that occurs in system startup func is really the first time we're at thread time. Really the first time that um, um, CE is starting to act and behave kind of the way a lot of people would have expected to be multi-process, multi-thread, and so forth. So let's, let's take a look at some of that in a little bit more detail. Um, and we'll do that by actually looking at some of the source code. By the one of my favorites. Where did I put that phone? Gee, I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry. I'm not thinking about this one. So I made this 24 point. Everyone read that in the back. Okay, cover your left eye with the top line. Good. Better, worse, better. Those optometrists just love to do that, right? Better, worse, better. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't changed a thing. <laughs> so here we are, startup. As it says, it's the entry point on all of the set. Uh, most of what I'm going through is pretty, pretty um, easy to do on your own, so I'm not going to belabor too many points. 
Um, if nothing else, the, the comments are entertaining to read. Um, here's one that's part of the, here's a piece that's part of the startup function. It says, determine if the code is running in RAM. The first time I encountered this, I thought, as opposed to where? <laughs> and as you think about it, you realize, okay, it could be running in, in um, NorFlash. It could be running in ROM, essentially. Do we even make ROM anymore? That's too good to But it could be running um, in the bootloader at physical address zero, and we actually could be doing a hard reset. It could be a power ROM. In which case, we've got to do something. We've got to go and initialize a bunch of things. But if, if, if we're just in a one reset, we get to jump somewhere else that assumes that those things have been initialized. And interestingly enough, when we, um, we just started working on um, the next generation drumsticks with the, the Vertex PXA270 uh, based um, device. And actually where we got screwed up is we have some old memory initialization code that for some reason memory controllers insist that you program it correctly. And right when we got here, we crashed. Couldn't figure out why. Okay, well we figured it out. But all this stuff to set up the memory controllers not just good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. See, why am I skipping? I'm skipping the best part. Skipping ahead to this point, where, which is where we jump to once uh, all memory, memory in the controllers in the box, and our CPU clock is up to speed. So when it starts up, it doesn't necessarily start up. At, uh, running at 400 megahertz when we run it normally, it starts up at a slower, slower rate. So at the end of the startup function, we have this uh, branch to OAL startup. I miss the good old days of x86 where they would just say jump. x86, buff. We're going to buff the OAL startup. So I'm going to show you both of the OAL startups real quick. Uh, but basically, one is for the bootloader, one is for the uh, regular CD startup. And there's all this crazy stuff. But I, I think basically, as long as you understand and realize that, uh, that the bootloader may also share this piece of code, like you want to share that piece of code. You won't get hopefully too confused. Just a really interesting one to look at is this one. Oh, I start up. It's interesting, but it's incredibly short. All we do is we call kernel start. And in calling kernel start, we are actually exiting the BSP specific code. And we're passing on, passing things on to um, to Microsoft written code. And the part of the code we're written, we're, we're going to access is um, what people call the loader kernel loader. So this is actually not kernel code, in the sense that it's not part of kernel.dll, it's not part of nk.exe. Uh, in fact, this is code that's part of our OAL. Um, and yet it's called kernel start. And this is, this is uh, code that, uh, that, that get, gets called at the state of the system when gee, the memory management is, is turned off, but we're going to go turn it on. And to turn it on, we need to set the page tables. So here we are. Uh, Set up the page tables, we need to go out and have the OEM tell us where do you want us to put things. And they do that by means of this OEM address table, which basically maps uh, virtual addresses on the left to physical addresses on the right. Uh, and there's some good stuff to do first level page tables, second level page tables. Uh, and then we call this function. So then we load the address of the virtual start. Virtual start is not actually the name of a function, it's the name of a data area or of a physical area that happens to contain the address of this. So we um, move that address into register zero. Uh, we, we twiddle our thumbs uh, and then we turn on memory manager right there. And right after we do that, we jump to this vstart function and right here, we're now uh, in virtual memory. Gee, how did I know that? Oh, okay, I cheated. I read the comments. Uh, then we do this, this interesting thing. Right before we enable interrupts, we go run around and set up stacks for the various interrupts. So well, that makes a lot of sense, right? You're going to want to have stacks to do, do the work that they need to do. There are actually more stacks in here than I remember ever seeing or encountering, but that's what they do. Um, now, one of the functions I want to show you is find kernel entry. And actually the comments, again, comments do, do, do some useful stuff. This is the function, find kernel entry. It's a function that actually finds that end case startup. And the way it does it is pretty wild. It's okay, we're going to take the table of contents, the directory for the ROM file system, 
We're going to loop through there until we find a file named kern dll. What's kern dll? Kern dll is kernel.dll. Okay, makes sense. And once we find that, we're going to take this value out of uh, we'll take a value out of the, the, the directory information. And that's essentially the entry point right here. So if we get that, we're good to go. What we do is we say, well, gee, did we get that? Because if we did get that, um, we do some calculations about the virtual link, the virtual address right here. Otherwise, we return zero. Find kernel entry is called by inside arm init. Uh, so here's arm init. Arm init calls kernel relocate. It calls find kernel entry. The return value from arm init is the return value from find kernel entry. So when we come back from our call, call to arm init, we pass a parameter in, in the uh, R0 register. And then we make our call to whatever that value is that we got back, which essentially is in the case start. Up. So that's that's one jump that is not intuitively obvious by looking at this code. So all of a sudden we're in the entry point for kernel.dll with the DLL name, if you will. And what do we do? Well at this point, what do we what do we know is that um, the CPU, everything's been turned off. Our memory management needs to be turned on. And um, page tables have, have um, been initially pop populated. All good stuff. Here's an entry point that's applicable to, uh, it looks like it uh, would be applicable to, to, to a DSP because it references a function called OEM and it globally. So because it says OEM, it sounds like it's an OAL kind of function. But if you actually dig into it and look for it, you see that, I don't know how well you can see the very bottom, um, it's actually located in the private directory. Um, I've got bookmarks in Visual Studio, and um, it was one of, the, one of those glue pieces that was used. And you may be aware that in, in CE6, Microsoft split the OAL from the, um, from the BSP, split the OAL from the kernel. The kernel.dll runs separately from um, OAL.dll. And this is one of those little glue pieces that, that exists. But it's not your function, you don't have to worry about it. But it, it was a little worrisome to me on the first side. Okay, so we're going here to inside ARM setup to initialize uh, the interrupt vectors. Um, now, these are interrupt vectors that are common to all ARM processors, which I guess are what the IRQ, the FIQ, and maybe a few others. Um, inside your OEM init, you're going to set up your own interrupts. That's a totally separate mechanism. We haven't called OEM init yet. We're still in the process of, of bringing up this the, 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 uh, the processor. Load pin limits there. It's a nice idea. And only at this point, with OEM init debug serial, this is the first call that gets made into OEM code. Now, there was some data that we used from the OEM address table, but OEM init debug serial is the first time that your code is actually called inside your, your, uh, your DSP. Um, I suspect this, this is probably done at a later point uh, in, in some earlier version of CE, but it's such an important thing to be able to do, to be able to, because, because we don't have the debugger, to be able to get output, that it, I think this is probably the earliest time that they can do it. A little later on is when OEM init gets called. It's kind of counterintuitive, but um, oftentimes you'll take a nib to the first function that gets called. It's really the second function that gets called. And then, now that we're in a situation where the, the, the uh, OAL has been initialized and uh, a lot of the processor is up, we then do this funky kernel find memory function. Kernel find memory is probably the, the most verbose function of, of any of the ones here. Um, just keeps wanting to tell you all this really great stuff that it's doing and it's done and the memory that's found and does a great job of that, I'm sure. Oh, and the other function that gets called is OEM cache range block. That's another <coughs> function. Hopefully minimal, minimally, uh, minimal to, uh, to implement at least there. And looky here, we've got another kernel start. Isn't that great? 
This kernel start, however, is in the context of kernel.dll, not in the context of the loader code. So previously, that was how the, the, uh, the BSP code called it into the loader code, I call it kernel start. This is uh, it's not that kind of code. This is part of kernel.dll. Um, so here's a look at kernel start. Now, oddly enough, kernel start is written in assembly language. There must be a good reason for it. Um, I'm not sure I know it. Oh yeah, of course. Because anytime you want to mess with registers like these, we need uh, special instructions like this. Um, that's why we do that. So having done that, we now call into some good old-fashioned C. And this is where we see this wonderful function uh, message in the CD kernel in it. And a whole series of, of functions that look like pretty good candidates for um, for starting an operating system like things. And the first of which is API, API call in it. Um, CE is basically organized into a whole series of little function tables. So there's a, there's a function table for all the thread functions, and a function table for all the mutex functions. And each kernel object, uh, each type, each class of kernel objects has its own uh, table. And there are also a series of other um, function tables that need to be filled in, those addresses need to be resolved. Um, really, the Win32 API would not exist if that function call didn't occur. Uh, then a bunch of other useful things gets called. The most interesting one of which, I think, is proc init, which as the name suggests, um, sets up a process, and thread init, which sets up a thread. And so if we take a look at proc init, we have a per, per process handle table in CD6, uh, like we had in all versions of CD. Threading is what I want to show you. Inside threading it, way down here, <coughs> initialize this thread structure, and then we open mk.exe, so we um, map this file in, and here's probably the most important final piece, the bridge to our final startup function, where we essentially set system startup function as being the entry point for this thread, or the current execution point for this thread. The thread is, is there, it's been created, it's, it's, it's nationed. Um, and so the next thing we need to do is somehow kickstart it. Uh, and the way you kickstart a first thread, I guess, depends upon your operating system. And CE, what they do is they make a call to this first schedule function. So after we call kernel limit, and I, I refer to kernel as being kind of like the way that uh, CE initializes all the static things that it needs to. And that system startup comes with all the dynamic things, all the runtime things that need to be initialized. So we, so we want to jump into first schedule, which is right here. And if you back it up, you see that it's in a, an assembly language function, which is named common fault handle, or comments call it a common fault handle. So anytime there's an interrupt, anytime there's a fault, anytime there's an exception, this code gets called. Um, one of the things, one of the kinds of interrupts that can occur is a schedule interrupt every 100 milliseconds, schedule interrupt occurring. And that's what we're going to be faking now. And that's what we do with this first schedule. So we call this handle exception function. Um, we fool the world into thinking that we uh, are just, are just uh, scheduling this thread to run, and then we disappear. So really, nowhere is there a specific call to system startup function except by, um, by that mechanism I just showed. So that, that makes this the hardest function of all to find. But once you find it, you can realize some of the cool stuff that's done, like, oh look, sys debug init. We're gonna enable debugging. That's a great idea. Another very cool thing I've discovered here, probably known to some of you already, but there's this kernel IOCTL that gets sent. So IOCTL help how post in it. So if you're working on a BSP or you're working on a project and you know that you want to do something really, really early on, even before any other process is started, within your OAL code, you can, um, in your IL control code, um, uh, OEM IL control, um, look for this code to get passed to you. It basically says that the very first thread in the system has started. 
no other application has started, and now would be a good time for you to do something if you want to do something really, really early in the life of the OS. Clearly a much better way than trying to sort of jury rig something or, or uh, hack something in. This is, this is the best way to do it. And lots of other good stuff. Okay, so then, kind of by way of review, we looked at startup. Um, and mostly what I did is turn everything off, call kernel start. Not, not, the, not the main kernel start, but just the kernel start that's inside the loader. Um, kernel start itself uh, initialized the memory management unit, got the, um, got the address inside kernel.dll and NK start, uh, called NK start with the help of ARMIT. Uh, NK startup then is what's actually inside kernel.dll. Um, defines the rest of memory for us, calls into the o OAL to uh, add it to its, its wonderful startup stuff. Um, it then calls into uh, kernel find memory to figure out how much memory we have there. Calls kernel start to um, call kernel init, which in turn does all this wonderful initialization of all the core OS facilities. And also, in that thread in it, sets things up for nk.exe to be loaded in the process, as well as its system startup function to be executed uh, with the help of the first schedule. The system startup function work really, um, we're now at thread time. Now it's scheduling time. The scheduler is up, um, the process is up, other processes can start running. Um, we're going to start reading the registry, reading the init key to start running other processes, um, if they've been defined. And so in summary then, um, probably the mo most important thing to do is pay attention to the debug messages. That, that's kind of an obvious one you see that out early on. Um, from a BSP perspective, the number one place to look, of course, is startup. But then there's a series of other OEM functions where you get called. Uh, OEM init globals isn't really your function, although I listed here as a BSP function just because uh, I think I got lazy. Um, but we um, initialize a serial output before, before you call to OEM init, and then we have, uh, of course, we look for extra memory. From the OS perspective, the, the key milestones are called the kernel start, so that, that kernel loader code, the code that we call, we call kernel start. The NK startup is what brings up kernel.dll. Finally, there's system startup pump, which is all the dynamic stuff that really gets the system up and running. So if you've got questions, I'd ask you to step up to the mic. Um, and this is probably a good opportunity for me to also remind you to please fill out your evaluations. Um, um, 